programming and if you have done assembly language programming, so have you done both? Have you done programming in C and programming in assembly language? Yes. How many of you have done both? Okay, a sizable number. So, what is the kind of productivity that you get when you program in C versus when you program in assembly? If, you, if I give you a problem, how long will you take to write something in assembly versus how long will you take to write that in uh, C, roughly? In C, you can try and uh, develop things faster, right? So, faster is actually much faster and probably less error prone also because when you do something on the assembly language level, you have to uh, be very, very careful about all the constructs that you use. The, you have to be wary of the cycles, the exact bits that you set and reset and so on. That's not the case when you program in C. And you have a whole slew of tools which will take a C program, then you have a compiler which will uh, break it down to an object code, then the linker and loader will load it and so on. Right? So you don't really worry about what's happening at the back end. You learn your programming language well, you know your problem well, and then you map one to the other. Just like that, there are lots of tools in hardware design that will take a description and make transistors out of it. So you saw a slight preview of this when you uh, when you were taught Verilog. Like, uh, there were, uh, I think uh, he talked, Heman talked about Verilog in the morning, right? So Verilog is a high level description language. It's a, a hardware description language as well. It's high level and hardware description language. You can model things at a fairly high level and leave it to tools which have been developed over decades and they are assumed to be correct, they, they are assumed to be optimizing also and you will get circuits that are designed that way. Okay, so when we are dealing with complexity, so when chips scale up, the kind of complexity that we deal in chips is roughly like the pictures that you see uh, here. So the picture on the left is actually Mount Road on what is now called Anna Salai in Madras. This was in year 1905 and the picture that you see on the right is uh, a side street in Madras in around 2000. Right? So if you are a city mayor managing uh, Madras, let's say 1905, you have to mostly manage bicyclists, very polite people mostly and one or two bullock carts, maybe a few motor vehicles and that's it. So the issue there is you have mostly homogeneous systems. So uh, well behaved people, well behaved vehicles and thereby you don't have too many problems. And the scale itself is very very tiny, very few vehicles. But you move over to 2005, you have cars, buses, cycles, uh, pedestrians, all of them sharing the same space. It's highly heterogeneous first. And these are very very different kinds of uh, vehicles and with very very different attitudes of drivers also. Right? So, what you are essentially looking at is a city management problem there. How do you manage traffic? Right? The same thing happens inside chips also. You have various kinds of blocks. Each block is optimized for something. Each block might have been designed with its own goal. And when you have to put various blocks together and make a system out of it, you have a city mayor kind of problem. Right? Yeah. Sometimes these blocks may not understand each other's protocol. The signaling levels or the voltage levels that they use may be different. You have to convert them. One is designed to uh, run at 60 kilometers, right? like cycles. Cycles try to do as as fast as possible sometimes. And they say, oh yeah, I should be able to drive on this road because the road is designed to uh, for vehicles to run at 50 or 60 kilometers. Cycles also come with an attitude. So what we have here is various design blocks that may not be compatible at all. And with, as a chip designer, you have to put all these things together and make the whole system work. So uh, what we will learn is how, how are these systems put together and how is it done in an automatic fashion. So we will look at the VLFA design flow. Uh, I think this is something that came and covered in detail, but I will give you a pictorial view of what the VLSI design flow is. We we'll start with a bunch of specifications which is usually uh, something which is done in English. So somebody tells you I want a chip which can do this and this and this and it better be consuming power like this because I am going to put it in a mobile device. Um, I want it to consume so much power and it can run at such a frequency and so on. All these things are usually specifications. And from specifications you usually come up with an algorithmic way to solve the problem. So if you remember this, this is a flow chart. So a flowchart is essentially a description by which you come and explain the various behaviors 
and you really don't know how these each of these uh, decisions will be taken, each operations, how are they better done and so on. You may not know this at this point of time. You have an algorithmic view of how to design a chip right now. Then what you do is you move on to, uh, you take each and every block and figure out what each block must do. So for example here, we have some kind of an addition, some multiplication and so on. So x equals ad is multiplication, y equals to cd is another multiplication and so on. So once you know that you need adders, multipliers and so on, you design each one of them and you are ready to plug in these things. So when you have each of these multipliers designed, what I meant is for each of these uh, blocks, you need the exact circuitry to do it. Uh, you got some of these exercises in the morning. So design this using these gates and so on, right? So that's exactly what, what we have here. So we have to implement these equations that we know in terms of basic gates that, that are there. And once you have these gates, this is where most of your coursework stops. You have not done anything beyond this, right? So you do things in terms of gates. Maybe you have uh, some experience with 74 series chips, put it on a breadboard, connect them and so on, right? So that's what typically happens in an undergraduate curriculum. But uh, chip design doesn't stop there. You don't get breadboards for your uh, Pentium processor or anything, right? So what we have is a sophisticated process that takes off from there and makes a chip out of it. So one of these things that you have to do is each of these gates is usually a few microns by few microns wide. So when you when you take a 34 series chip, it looks like uh, it's a big chip, right? Yes, it is a big chip. But the actual circuitry there is pretty pretty tiny. And the circuitry that we have now is a lot more tinier than the circuitry that is there in the 74 series chips. So what you have is each and every gate is probably a few microns wide by a few microns height. So to uh, put that in perspective, uh, the human hash diameter is about 50 microns in uh, diameter. So that's the kind of uh, uh, transistor size that we are looking at. So HIV virus is a little bigger than the human has diameter. So we are looking at that kind of precision for all the manufacturing also, not just the design, but also for manufacturing. That's why you are able to squeeze in so many transistors in an area which is typically about 1 millimeter by 1 millimeter. So if you go and buy a Pentium chip, uh, how many of you are from Madras? Some of you. So you probably know Ritchie Street by now, right? So if you are any engineer worth your salt, you should know Ritchie Street by now. So, uh, so you, when you buy a chip, it may look like it's a few centimeters by few centimeters chip, right, and on the outside. So you have all the pads and the packaging and everything, but the actual silicon with which the chip is made is a few millimeters by few millimeters. So it's probably two millimeters square, nothing more than that. Within that, you're going to squeeze in one billion transistors and all the connections that go with it, all the wires that connect these transistors internally. Right? That's the kind of scale of problem the tools which look at these transistors, so essentially my CAD tools or the CAD tools that you're going to develop should take 1 billion transistors, should know the connections between these transistors and squeeze them within a 1 millimeter by 1 millimeter.